It's my pleasure to welcome Chad Brown. He is in Utah, right, Chad? I am, yes, sir. And and so far in my life, everyone from Utah has been nothing but gracious and nice and fun. And I don't think you're going to break the record. So, oh, no, the pressure's on. Yeah, uh, 100%. So <laughs> go for it. Just, uh, just give us a quick overview without telling any secrets, because I got a bunch of questions mm. for you. Yeah, yeah, Who yeah. are you? What do you do? Um, that's a good question. I start with, I'm a husband to, uh, my beautiful wife, Katie, we'll be 20 years next year. So that's really exciting. Feels like a milestone. Um, feels like a couple of lifetimes We and, and, um, I'm so grateful for her. I'm also a dad of three kids. Um, so 16, 16, 13 and nine bo- girl, girl, boy. So, Uh, I often say that fathering teenage girls is one of the greatest lessons in leadership that I've been given. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) And then ultimately, I'm a leadership engagement coach. So that's really fancy speak for I get to work with founders and CEOs. Uh, on a on a daily basis in the most important and impactful conversations that they're having with themselves and about their teams. And oftentimes we we get to get to have those conversations with their teams as well. So I absolutely love what I do. Um, it feel I don't look forward to vacation. Um, I'm on vacation and I look forward to coming back to work. <laughs> um, I, I love my vacations too, but I absolutely, I pinch myself every single day that this is the work that I get to do. I think that's something that that's, I think we share because I'm, somebody asked me, what do I do? Well, 11 years ago, I quit a good job and I wanted to become what turned out to be a business coach. So I, I live in a coaching world and, and we'll get into that a little bit later with some challenging questions for Chad, but um, I'm a coach. And without a doubt, um, it's been the most fulfilling thing I've done in my business career, mm-hmm. uh, being able to coach people. And we could talk about why it's so fulfilling compared to, a, you know, corporate universe history. But uh, we'll touch on that in a few minutes. I love the fact that you started with, I'm a father, a uh, husband. Well, I, I think you said husband first, father next. Good yeah. for you. Priorities in order. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, if that relationship with Katie is not um, healthy, if we're not communicating, then I can't do my job with the founders and the leaders that I work with in a mm-hmm. in a powerful way. So that's number one. I also can't father well if that relationship is not in 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 alignment. Yeah, and I, I I hate corny stuff, but I'll I'll throw one out. Maybe it'll be the yeah. only one we use in the podcast. <laughs> behind behind every I'll I'll rephrase it. Behind every happy man, there is a a solid woman. I'm, I'm rephrasing. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, the um, only bone I'll pick with that saying is that she's not behind me. By by your side. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Correct. You're right. You you know what? You're right. That that quote's probably way, way, way too old for this. Um <laughs> all right. So so let let's dive in, Chad. I run into you. Did you grow up in Utah? I did, yeah. Okay. So I you know, I walk down the street and I run into Chad when he's 15 and I say, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? What's the answer? At 15 years old, I mean, that 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 answer would have changed in different phases of my childhood. At 15 years old, I probably would have told you that I wanted to be a uh, either a professional skateboarder or a um, somebody who restored Volkswagen vehicles. Okay, hopefully Beatles, because that was one of my first cars. <laughs> I had a 74 Volkswagen bus. Oh, the bus. Those are the best. Aren't they bringing them back? I thought I saw something. There's always been whispers of something modern coming out. They've done a couple of concepts, but I don't know if they'll ever actually revisit it. I think it would kill. I think it would be amazing. So funny story about the bug. I, I came here from Israel as a as a foreign student. They didn't have much money. At some point, I got a job and I needed a car, and I knew nothing about buying cars in the U.S. So 
my well, my cousin took me to a place. We saw a, a bug. I don't remember what year it was. Uh, I drove around the block. It felt good. It was stick shift, which is the only way I knew how to drive. And I yep. said, okay, I bought it. Yeah. And then we need to be, it has to be inspected. So we take it to the to the mechanic around the corner and the guy goes in. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I can't even lift the car because it's all rotted underneath. It, oh. if, I, if I put those lifter things, whatever, it's so, what do we do? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it, but I can't put it on the lift. Fine. Well, unbeknownst to me, and you know those cars, um, we're talking now early 90s, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't remember how old the car was, probably 70s. Mm -hmm. The way you get heat, there was no air conditioner in the bug. There was no such thing. It was just sure. heat. No. The way yeah. you get heat, there was a lever that you pulled up. I think it was a heat box underneath. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is like warm air from the muffler that you could probably die if you breathe it, but you pick it up. And hot air comes from, I guess, the engine, from whatever. The, the engine it. block. Yeah, it's yeah. pulling air from the engine compartment. Okay. Uh, my, what do I know? I don't know anything. So uh, this is winter, and I'm all excited, and I'm getting a car, and one day when it was 25 degrees out, and I warm it up, and I start to drive, and I say, okay, it's time to put the heater, and I pull the thing, and the pill just comes up in my hand. No heat comes out. Nothing. I mean, the <laughs> whole thing just came apart. So for... Four months you in the winter because that was the only car I already bought it for six hundred dollars. I would I worked in JFK Airport, so I would have to leave at six o'clock in the morning to get to my shift. I would literally my routine was I had an army blanket that I brought from Israel. I wrapped myself up with an army blanket. I had one of these giant 7-Eleven coffee travel mugs. I put hot coffee in it. I apologize for my listeners, but put it between my legs and <laughs> And that's that's how I drove to work, uh, like during the winter, and then eventually I was able to get rid of it. All right, so and you're a better uh, man for it. Oh, listen, the little things in life that make you appreciate, quote unquote, the things that we take for granted, right? Absolutely. Um, so, all right, so we'll fast forward. I love interviewing people who were psychology majors in college, which you were. I was. I didn't graduate, oh, but I did major in psychology. Okay. Um, so I know why I picked psychology. My dad wanted me to be an accountant. I said, there's no way yeah. okay, I'm walking around with a number two pencil up my ear and then doing numbers all day. So I'm to this day obsessed with the human brain. Yes. What What made you pick psychology? It, it, was, um, it was complete happenstance, Sev. I, you know... College is designed or was designed. I actually don't know how it's designed now. I'll be finding out soon with my 16 year old. But you know, you have your generals, and it's a brilliant system because you've got to start at the you, at the bottom of your college experience, at the beginning of your college experience. You've got to start just taking a plethora of a lot of different classes on across a lot of different subjects. And this is, you know, at, at first or in the moment, it feels like such a drag. Oh, man, can I just start studying what I'm going to study? But now I'm so grateful for it. It's a brilliant design because I never would have considered psychology. I never would have. It, it just wasn't part of my life or part of my brain. Nobody in my in my family, nobody that I knew or looked up to or mentored from was in in the field of psychology. And so I just it wouldn't have even occurred to me. But I took a I took an entry psychology class and the professor was brilliant, just absolutely brilliant in the way that he was very nuanced. I never, to this day, I still don't know where he stands on a lot of things. You know, he's a very, he was a philosophically leaning psychology teacher. So he brought a lot of philo uh, philosophy into the curriculum. And that's where I say, like, I still to this day don't have a clue where he stood politically, religiously, nothing. And I loved it. I was like, wow, this is a space where we can discuss the humanness of life in a very nuanced way. And we can really study how the mind works. And we don't have to let our preconceived stories, notions, dogma, all of that color how we study this. We can just look at what it is 
And that, man, that opened my eyes to a whole new world and opportunity of understanding human beings. I call it the humanness of us because it's our, the humanness, our, our, the, the fingerprints of our humanness is on everything that we do. We can't escape it. Businesses are colored by our humanness. All of this AI stuff, yeah, great, that's fine. It's still in the context of how we think as human beings. And that just opened up a whole world of, for me, of like uh, understanding other people. It opened a world of empathy for me, uh, you know, coming as, as a, as a teenage kid, I didn't give a lot of thought to other people's experience. And it opened up such a, a an opportunity for me to dive into that in a, in a nuanced, non-judgmental and uh, ultimately helpful way. That's a, a a cool introspection about the topic. For me, it was to this day. I'm still obsessed with human brain. Um, mm. it, it's it's a fa fascinating organ, and the stuff that's that's in here is just mind blowing. Uh, I'm particularly interested in behavioral psychology as it relates to marketing. And the more I have more time now to dive into it, and it's just it's just absolutely amazing from little word choices that 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 make people behave in a certain way and i'm not saying it from a from a take over somebody's brain or sure. artificial manipulative stuff yeah. it's just the way we process things right uh which is which is really really interesting so you said you didn't finish college right and when i kind of reviewed your background uh you somehow dive into into sales and marketing as a kid right in your early jobs no, I mean, I was mostly in construction and I grew up, my dad, my dad worked construction. Uh, he was, he hung drywall his whole life. He hung drywall his whole life. And I started working with him really young. Um, by the time I was about 14 or 15, I was the one going out and finding jobs. So in a, in a sense, yes, but it was much okay. more around relationship than it was branding, marketing, which mm -hmm. I mean, relate everything is relationship, but that was much more of my focus is just staying top of mind of those who were, you know, those contractors out there who were hiring drywallers. And so um, in a sense, yes, but I wouldn't, I at the time wouldn't have ever thought of it as branding or marketing. So, but, so that was your uh, sort of like foray into, I mean, it is sales. I mean, we can, we can color sure. it whatever we want, but a 15 year old kid walks around and, and, creates connections or talks to people in the concern and say, Hey, by the way, you guys are building and my dad does hang yes. puts up drywall. You should use my dad. That's right. That's still, that's still sales. And well, you know, 15 year old, it's a lot of pressure on you to go do that as opposed to chasing beautiful blonde women. Cause it's the only thing I think exists in Utah, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I think, you know, through a through a series of of other life events, I ended up starting, and this may have been what you're referring to. I ended up starting a film production studio uh, in 2009. Yeah, so, Shade Tree Films. Yeah, that's correct. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a lot of that experience with my dad colored how I showed up in that business, how I created it, how I tended to lead in it. Um, lots of mistakes. Um, but also lots of really powerful lessons working with him that I'm grateful for. So, uh, so that's actually one of the questions I have for you. And somebody who, at least from what I learned about you, and, and I guess it was earlier than I than I realized. You start at 15, 16, and you go out and you and you hustle for your dad's business. Mm -hmm. in, in up until the point where you started Shade Tree Films, which we'll get to next. But looking back at what do you think was the biggest lesson you learned from those early years? Oh man, the, oh, there's so many before shade tree films. The biggest lesson I learned is to not do anything for money hmm. or for money alone. The reason being is because the reason I dropped out of college out of the psychology program at Utah, Utah Valley university is because I was confronted with an opportunity to invest in real estate. And this was about 2007 when the idea was presented to me 
Um, and so I thought, man, I could really make a lot of money. If you know, if you remember what the real estate market was doing in 2007, in early 2008, everybody was yeah. making some money in real estate. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I got really starry eyed. I got really attracted to the dollar signs that were possibility. And uh, the plan seemed solid to me. I knew absolutely nothing. Um, and the plan was that we would gather some investors and we would, the, the investors would put the properties in their names. They would get the loans. They would get the construction loans. Um, and then we would build the house and sell the house. And then we would split the profits with the investors. And so I put a couple of the properties in my name, gathered my friends and my family. Cause like what's, what could go wrong? Right. I mean, let's just, let's go all in on this thing. So, uh, gathered as many people as we could, uh, to, to dive into this. And then towards the end of 2008, we were in the middle of construction on 38 units, 24 of those being a condo conversion of an apartment building that we bought with hard money in order to close the deal and get working on it. And we thought we'd be able to get traditional loan or traditional funding on it. And like overnight, everything dropped out. It right. just tanked. So, so to, for the sake of the people that are listening to us, maybe watch us on YouTube later, 2008 is the really the start of what many considered as close as we came to a depression. Right on years, right? the Great Recession. Like, some people everything, call. yeah, everything collapsed. Most of it was greedy bankers that almost did it again a couple of weeks ago. Yep, by selling not just bankers but insurance companies selling mortgages and loans to people that had no business. That's right. Or credit they, or anything, right? That's or right. Anything. They knew they couldn't get it paid back. Yeah, yeah, but but everybody on the lending side and the finances that was making so much money anyway, they couldn't care less. And just so people understand, there were companies on the internet that would fake a W-2 form showing the kind of income you could present to a, to a banker in order to get a mortgage right. or whatever it was. I mean, it was absolutely insane. I didn't know it was happening because somebody that worked for me, one of the women in my, my team came to me one day and said, uh, could you do me a favor? And said, what? I said, you know, I'm only making $35,000, but... We're looking to buy a house. My husband is a handyman. The house is kind of falling apart, but we don't qualify for a mortgage because our income is not big. So could you give me a letter that says <clears throat> that I'm making 70000 And I looked at her and I said, absolutely not. Uh, if you can't afford a house, you shouldn't be buying a house. And secondly, we're not as a company, even though I was an executive, an officer, I am never, ever going to do that. Okay, that's mortgage fraud. Illegal. That's illegal. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so I'm sorry. You know, guess what? She found somebody to do it for. Her. They bought yeah. the house. They renovated. Whatever it was. So anyway, yeah, so you're dreaming big. You know what I'm thinking about, Chad? Like as you're what describing this, I'm immediately thinking about the Bitcoin people. Yeah. When it first started, right? It was a similar thing. Um, yeah. So you guys are all in. Then literally, the floor, the ground, whatever, collapse under you, right? Yeah, my my world, um, what I thought was my world shattered, and I I it, it felt like it was overnight. You know what's crazy? You, you tell that story about your the the woman who worked for you, is that all of our investors got traditional lending from traditional banks on a stated income loan, <laughs> meaning they didn't verify a single piece of information these people gave that's how bad this thing was that's how bad this thing was and we were in deep now the investors that we brought in all qualified they were fine there wasn't any fraud involved but it was so it, now i look back on it i'm like that is wild that there was this uh, you know the banks were lending out half a million six hundred thousand dollars on a construction project without state without verifying any of the information that the people were stating that they that they had. Mm -hmm. So anyway, went into a deep depression, really took it hard. Um, of course, a lot of my friends and family are involved. And at that moment, the best thing that came out of that in that moment was 
I just had this single thought. Don't ever do anything just for money again. It's not because it's not like I was doing that just because I loved it or because it was exciting or whatever. It's just that I saw the I saw the potential to make a lot of money. And what I what that did is it blinded me to paying attention to the signs of that this might not be the experience or this might not be the opportunity that I think it is or that others presented it to me. Did and if, you did you talk to your dad about this? I did not. No. <laughs> uh, there you go. See, I was looking for where did you make the biggest mistake? And I, I don't know your dad, but I'll tell you why I'm asking the question. Because if you yeah. talk to your dad about this, he would have said to you, don't do it. Why? Possibly. Because in, because in his world, because of what he did for a living, similar to my dad who would work 12 hours in a small grocery store, they understand that, yes, you could get lucky, but most more most of the time it's hard work that gets you where you want to go that's it's right not these these fly by night bs stuff that's right and he would have said to you don't do it or maybe do it on a small scale but you didn't Possibly. talk to him i was suspecting no, no, no. you didn't talk to him no i went big I'm, I'm a big go big or go home kind of guy and you know what was missing for me is that if, if i truly loved it i would have committed myself to learning everything about it and that's the difference that that's the difference that I noticed after that experience. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't understand what it meant to truly love something. And then that drives you to learn every like you talk about the brain and loving learning about the brain. And now you study it, you think about it. That's what happens when we're in love with something or we choose to love something. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I mean, hindsight's 2020, but I realize now. I was just there to make money to try to create some status for myself. I love the idea of looking like the successful guy and I didn't do enough homework. I didn't love it enough to put it in my bones, as I say. And that was the problem because if I had, if I had loved it enough and slowed down to make it meaningful, I would have been able to see, I think pretty clearly that this is not going to hold. Yeah, so you know the the good the old saying is if it's too good to be true, then it's it probably too good to be is. true. But and when everybody around you is making money doing something, you get sucked in by temptation, brain, and you say, well, if they're all making money and there's an opportunity to go in, and it sounds good, right? The, mm -hmm. the real estate's blowing up. The the thing we don't know is there's a mysterious curve in that scenario. We don't know if it's still going up or it's actually on its way down, but you don't know how close it is, right? And then an external force happens and then boof, it all, That's goes, right. all goes nuts. So so you learn from that. Don't you know going don't go into business with money as a motivator. And then you start. So so tell me about Shade Tree Films. Yeah. What was that about and why'd you start it? Well, I mean. Video saved my life. I, I I mean that quite literally. I was so depressed. I was questioning whether or not I wanted to keep living. I, I mean, it didn't. I I obviously. I mean, it wasn't as serious as I was making plans to to kill myself or anything like that. But I was really questioning what this was about. At this time, we had just had our second daughter, and uh, she was brand new in the world. And I'm wondering, like, what in the hell am I doing bringing children into this world? How how much of a failure I am? You know the story, the, the racket that goes on inside the brain at the time of falling down. And um, I, in that conversation of don't ever do anything just for money again, I remembered that I loved making videos in high school. It was one of the things that um, really... I connected to, I understood it. I was a, I was a really great storyteller. I pushed myself to improve the image. And I was part of, I was president of the filmmaking club and I just really loved it. I, I never thought of it as, as a career beyond, I never thought of it as a career. It was just something fun that I did in high school that I really loved. And I remembered that. And so that day I talked to Katie, my wife, 
And I told her we, we, we had nothing at this point. I mean, we lost all, all of it, bankruptcy, you know, whole, the whole dramatic thing, the bank takes the cars, you move out and out of the house, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And, uh, we, we literally had nothing. And I said to her, I want to go buy a video camera and I want to start making videos and being the amazing human being that she is, she could see that this was important to me. We did not have the money for it. Um, I took out a loan to buy that camera. And um, I, it was a personal loan because my credit was shit through all of that. And um, took out a loan to buy that camera and a couple of lights. And I started learning everything I possibly could about video and storytelling and what moves emotion. You want to talk about a, having a foundation of psychology. Every storyteller has to have some foundation of psychology, whether that's from life experience or traditional education. And I put that work, that fascination with psychology to work in storytelling about how I could drive emotion for people to do something. Because that's what good video marketing does, is it drives an emotional reaction to make a choice. And I learned everything I possibly could about that. Found somebody in Southern California that I wanted to learn from who was doing some really amazing, beautiful work. Asked him if I could come and understudy. Did that. Understudied with him for a couple of shoots. Knew immediately that I wanted to. Asked him if I could come work for him. Came home. Loaded up my family in our Scion XB. So at this point, we have two kids. Me and my wife, and if you know what a Scion XB is, it's those tiny cars that look like a refrigerator on wheels. There's zero trunk space, <laughs> and it's four-seater. We strapped everything we could to the top of that thing, and we drove out to Southern California to pursue film, to pursue uh, video. And um, man, it grew faster than I could imagine. Um, and, and I, it all, it, it was all because of my love of it, my willingness to actually put it in my bones in a way that I could create results for people that were, that they wanted to tell everybody about. And we just grew like wildfire. I, I ended up partnering with the gentleman who I understudied with for a couple of months uh, turned out when I moved out to California to work with him, turned out he didn't have much business sense, but he was a brilliant video guy. Uh, so I brought some of the, some of the business sense to uh, our operation and, um, and we ran. So there's this, you said, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. There's a song by Tina Turner called uh i think it's tina turner what's love got to do with it <laughs> i'm gonna i want to turn it on you because from from this is an entrepreneurial show you can love what you do all day long but you still have to go out and get clients somebody's gotta sure. go pay for that love how did you guys find clients yeah people we, to believe in you that can you can do the video production we took a lot of risks a lot of risks meaning our ego so we would, you know, we started in weddings and oh. we, and we decided that we were going to be the premier wedding filmmakers, even to use the word filmmaker in that industry at the time was really odd. Uh, also, there's luck. There's so much luck that comes into play in this because we hit this. So 2010, we hit this right at the time where DSLRs, which is a small camera a small mirrorless camera was starting to shoot beautiful HD video with depth of field and, you know, great coloring. And this was revolutionary because before then, if you wanted that cinematic look, you had giant rigs and you're not going to go shoot a wedding with a giant rig and your lighting and all of that sort of stuff. So we got super lucky with technology being accessible and mobile. We could create a cinematic look based off of this very small camera, you know, and we were, we were, we were experimenting with all kinds of stabilization that nobody was experimenting with. We were, um, my partner at the time was wearing a steady cam. If you know what that is, it's a big body rig with a, with a 
an arm on it with a spring and we'd have DSLRs on there. And we were, we were wearing a steady cam at weddings. So when you, you know, it was revolutionary at the time. I know it doesn't make it, the, 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 the equipment now is so great, but at the time to have this sweeping smooth steady cam shot of the bride coming out of or coming down the stairs and down the aisle was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And, um, we took risks. We went out into the industry and we just said, Hey, here's who we are. Can we come and shoot for you? We'll shoot for free, whatever, whatever we've got to do to start getting the word of word out about this idea that we have that wedding videos could be a story and could be cinematic. And that, you know, when I say risk, it's like what we were risking was, uh, was, uh, rejection, a hit to the ego. And ultimately the work that we did in weddings, the, the, I would say, I don't know, maybe revolutionary is a little pretentious, but like the, the way that we were rethinking that work caught the eye of a couple of large commercial brands. And namely Volkswagen literally saw one of our wedding videos and approached us and asked us what it would take for us to do some promotional video work for them. And at that point it was off. I mean, it was off to the races and, and we just kept taking what the one thing about that business that worked so well is that we never stopped taking risks. We never stopped pushing ourselves into realms of business and industries and verticals that scared the crap out of us. And, and you really, again, if you know about entrepreneurship and the roller coaster ride, um, you, you kind of have to do this because if you just settle in, even if, you know, I say, I always use the word roller coaster because that's what life is about when you're a business owner, right? You, you, you hit, Vol you hit Volkswagen. And then after that, somebody else came in and you rise and you rise, but at some point someone's going to go away and then you're going to drop again and you're going to find it. But if you continuously use the word risk, venture into areas, uh, and, and it's not, to me, it's not risk. You're looking for ways to differentiate yourself because if you just do the same thing over and over again, at some point, someone else is way past you because they have adopted or went to in into directions that no one else was thinking about. That's right. So if you just, if you just want to be a commodity and want to be a videographer, then good luck. You know, you're going to sure. die slow, painful death, not going to happen long-term. Um, so, so kudos for you guys for doing that. Now, the amazing part is, is at some point when I kind of looked and kind of dove into your, into your career, you become a coach. Yeah. So how do we go from, I love video to coaching? There's a, there's two, um, storylines that I attribute to that trajectory. The first one is just because you're really good at building a desired product does not mean you're good at leading people. And those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And I was very good at building a product that people wanted. I was terrible at leading people in building that product. I made so many mistakes in our business with our people. And, you know, at, at one point, early 2000, well, late 2011, early 2012, we had a studio with, it doesn't really matter, but I think we had three or four employees on the production side and we had four or five editors, full-time editors in the studio. And I was not a good leader. And at this point, I had allowed the business to take over my life. I was an absentee father. I was an absentee husband. My wife at this point was with our two little girls in a small apartment in Southern California with no network, no friends. I mean, we had just plopped ourselves there. I mean, she was making friends, but it, you know, with toddlers, it's difficult. And I was gone. I was traveling over 300 days of the year. 
doing all of this big brand work, speaking from stages, you know, all of this stuff that really stroked my ego as a, as a business owner, as an pr- entrepreneur, we were hitting success in our minds. And I was miserable. And my partner was miserable. And our spouses were miserable. And our kids didn't see us. And our employees were miserable because they're working for these guys who are driving them into the ground and expecting so much from them and without much recognition of their humanness or much reward for when they shine. And it came, all of that, through a couple of events, all of that came to a head. And um, my partner and I sat down, we said, well, this isn't working. And if we can't figure out how to make this thing work in the next six months and be present for our families and be this be a great place for people to work, then we'll walk away. But we know we can't do it alone because we created this. (laughs) And so we put it out to our network and just said, hey, here's where we're at. That was really, I mean, even that moment of time of asking for help with our vendors or our partners or whatever, just saying, hey, here's the truth of where we're at and we've got to figure this out. Do you know anybody that helps do this? I didn't even know what a business coach was. And luckily, one of our partners, uh, beloved, still a best friend of mine, uh, designer, uh, graphic designer said, yeah, I actually know a guy. You might want to talk to him. That guy's name was Adrian Kaler. Is Adrian Kaler. And um, we hired him on the spot first conversation and we worked i ended up working with him for four years in my leadership he helped me navigate an amicable amicable um separation with my business partner he helped me gain my life back with my family to become the father that i was proud to be and the husband that i was proud to be he helped me create this brand that was independent of me and my personality so that it could carry on and actually do meaningful work beyond me I didn't have to be on everything. It just changed my world. And ultimately, I realized through that process, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be providing this opportunity for other business owners, for other founders and entrepreneurs. So can I beat you up a little bit? Because you're from Utah and you're nice. So Yeah, go for it, man. <laughs> so, I can so you, take it. You, you go through the crash by deciding I'm never going to do anything for money. And then you wind up spending 300 days out of the year traveling, blowing it up for money. And well, then, I didn't well, see it, it that way. Yeah, uh, right. But, but Katie must have talked to you about this right she said dude we we came from nothing into here we don't see you what's the point she must have told you something yeah eventually i mean you're providing and it's working well but yeah isn't the kids need their father and sure she she needs you right she grew up in a home that had very much a similar pattern and um, I love and respect her her dad so much, but it, the work was the primary um, uh, focus, and that was to provide for the family, and and that's how they lived. She didn't see him much, so I don't know that she recognized something was off. Yeah. That, I mean, she sense. didn't like it, of course. Yeah. She didn't like it, but but, you know, there are stories or narratives that we except at times of all oh, this is just how it's supposed to be in fact that's so much of my work with founders and you know this so much of my work with founders and entrepreneurs is interrupting those stories and saying hey what are you are you sure that that's how it's supposed to be so so you experience firsthand uh the the benefit of coaching and then at some point you realize well, if happened to me as an entrepreneur, this must be this must be a way of life for a lot of people. I saw, business, right? I saw it everywhere. I saw it everywhere. And that's um, the other that's the other line of story that I contribute to this is that through um our work as as 
video creators, I got a lot of opportunities to speak from stages and to coach other filmmakers and video people in their businesses. And I saw the same patterns. Yeah. So you, you make a decision to, again, you go all in with coaching. Yep. Now, so, t so I know how I did it, but it, it doesn't matter about my story, but for you, how I want to hear your story. How do you make the transition from holy crap, this guy changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I now have a, an appreciation to something I didn't know existed called coaching. Yeah. But now this is what I want to do. Now, yeah. so, so you go to Katie and you say, guess what? Chapter, uh, this is going to be chapter three. One was real <laughs> estate, two was video. I'm now going to quit this thing and become a coach. Yeah. How does that conversation go? Well, there's a really beautiful, I mean, it just, again, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about luck for a minute because so much of what Adrian helped me understand was that this has the potential to be something meaningful for clients. Meaning this, I mean, the, the film business, this has something has potential to be meaningful beyond you. It doesn't have to be dependent on you. So if you want to lead in that way, you can build a team that can carry this legacy that you've built uh, or this product that you built, they can carry it for you. And that to me was like, that became the ultimate aim. And without yet knowing that I was going to move on to something new. And so he helped me create that in the business. It operated mostly without me. Um, and, you know, had a bit, had a manager in there and doing incredible work. And anyway, so, I really set that stage. I was really lucky that I set that stage so that it really set me up nicely for this moment where I decide that I want to do something with coaching. And so I kept the business and it operated and I start understudying with Adrian, start asking, you know, getting more coaching from him about being a coach, attend, you know, going out to offsites with him. Uh, asking him questions, reading everything that he'll give me, all of that sort of stuff to start making that transition something meaningful. And Katie was behind it a thousand percent. And that's one thing that I'll always be so grateful to her is that her trust and her confidence in me and what I what what's next has always been unquestioned. Mm -hmm. But so again, the interesting part here, Because, I mean, I quit a great job to, and I didn't know what coaching was about. I was yeah. pitched for, I was pitched for, to be a coach by, by a company. Somebody gave him my name and said, Hey, he quit because he wants to be, because he wants to be, <clears throat> I never said I want to be a consultant because I don't like that term. Yeah. And to me, and to me, consultant represents something that I never liked. And I threw some of them out of my office in my corporate career. So it's yeah. not what I wanted to do, but I wanted to do the kind of stuff that, that you experienced first then is uh, I've worked for people all my career, mostly family owned businesses, small businesses. And so the hard work and the risk that they, they went through to create a business and provide for other people. Uh, and in more often than not, the biggest obstacle to any progress in the company, meaning more growth was the business owner. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it was the business owner is because they were completely in a cocoon of not realizing that they were sucked into this routine of entrepreneurship and not being able to get out of it. Right. That's it right. wasn't quite, it wasn't quicksand because it doesn't end with you being sucked under, but it's sort of like a quicksand of the, the chaos and the, it, it's, it really is an addiction. That's, that's how I often describe it. it absolutely right? is. You know, yes. being a business yeah. owner, especially if the business is not functioning well, and you've got all these issues is an addiction because as much as they hate it, they thrive on it because mm -hmm. because things fires happen every second and oh I'm I'm the owner I'm gonna go fix it I wanna no it's much easier when you have systems and process and leadership and people are happy coming to work and you get to drive your vision whatever you want to do it, it's a, but they don't know that that reality exists it's their own reality so anyway I, well, somebody can i use... can i say something about that really quick yeah, yeah of, course, of course one of the conversations that i inevitably find every, with every single one of my clients at some point pretty early on in our relationship is that you want it this way 
you want it this way because you created it this way. Mm -hmm. It so does I, something for you. Chad, I want to dive into coaching for this, the stuff that yeah. the remaining time, because that's the, that's going to be fun, fun for us. So let, let's dive in and I'm going to start, I'm going to read from things that, that either you said, or are, are as part of your, the group that you're part of. Yeah. Um, all right. That I'm, I'm going to use, it's not curse word, but this word is allowed on TV, so I can use it. <laughs> most assessments are bullshit. Most off-sites are bullshit. Yeah. Most coaching is bullshit. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're going to be insulting a bunch of people with that, 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 that I just read to, particularly coaches. <clears throat> and by the way, it's, I don't necessarily disagree with what you said, but let's, let's unpack this. Okay? Yeah. Um, why is coaching bullshit? What do you, what does that mean? Well, the statement is most of it. <clears throat> and the reason that most of it is bullshit is because it's unwilling to see its own bullshit. That's what makes it bullshit. So let me just unpack that for a second, right? So there is a, um, very famous, well, I don't know about very famous. He was for his time. He was a very, very popular trainer. And he ended up being um, a mindset trainer for a lot of high profile people. Sorry about that. Um, and he stood in front of a crowd of a couple of thousand people. And he, he said this. He said, you're all assholes. And the crowd kind of chuckled and laughed and, you know, that sort of thing. And he said, you want, you want to know how I know you're all assholes? And, and he said, the reason I know you're all assholes is because you're all sitting there thinking about how you're not assholes. So the, the idea is, is that most, most coaching doesn't recognize its own bullshit meaning if i i've got to understand i'm even though i'm a even though i'm a coach i still own bullshit i still have my stories i still have the things the the excuses that i make for myself it's be, it's the human experience now the difference is and i'm not saying this is always true for me but most of the time, I'm willing to be in a conversation with myself and with other people about my bullshit. And what that does is it gives us a foundational conversation about what's real rather than what we hope is real or what we make up is real. So that's the statement about these different things being bullshit is that so many coaches right now are so precious about what they do and their message that they're unwilling to see where they're inconsistent with their message. So can, can we define bullshit? Sure. Because, I mean, I, I like the explain it like an 80, to an 80-year-old. Yeah. When we say most coaching is B, I'm going to use BS, so I don't have okay, to repeat let's... that word so much. But <laughs> if most coaching, is, most coaching is BS, what is the BS part of coaching? Like, define it. I, you said, like, not be believing in your own, as we say in New York, in your own shtick, but not, what is it exactly? Yeah, that's right. So there's an unwillingness to see that something else is possible rather than the story that you've made up, right? So we were talking about my, uh, how I created this company that wasn't working for me. Like I, so here's one of the things. On one of my first calls with our coach, I, I told him I'm a family man. And he said, you're lying. And I said, I was like offended. And I was like, uh, no, I, I am a family man. I know that because that's what's important to me. And he, te he said, you know, you want to know how I know you're lying? I said, yeah, sure. Tell me how you know I'm lying. Because, and he said, because if you wanted that, like if that's what you truly were, that's what your aim was, you would have it. 
And my world transformed in that moment, literally transformed into the idea that I have what I want. I create what I want, even if I say I want something else. Now, I'm not immune to that just because I'm a coach now. Uh, there's still stories that I run. Now, the difference is, is am I open to seeing the stories that I'm creating and open to different and new possibilities for myself and for my clients? Most coaches, I'm just going to say that, that I've experienced are unwilling to see that. And I believe that's what gives us our edge because if we can't, you, see, you hear the words or you hear the phrase kind of cheesy, but you spot it, you got it. In order for me to see any pattern of story in my clients of where they're getting in their own way, I have to first recognize it in myself. Mm -hmm. So I uh, bring this back to psychology and sharing because we work with clients and business owners. Um, it, it's, it's not a phenomenon. It's a psychology of human behavior. We all tell mm -hmm. ourselves, we tell ourselves stories constantly in order to not deal with things that we know or we're afraid of. That's right. Exist under the surface, right? That's it's right. The, it's the good old flight or fight mechanism, right? That's the right. The, the amygdala in the back of our head, what Seth Godin calls the old brain, the lizard brain. Yes. It's still it's still active, right? If I'm going to start thinking for a second that I'm on the road a lot and I'm missing my daughter's dance or or recital, and you know maybe I miss my wife's birthday. God forbid. That's that's terrible. <laughs> uh, Oh, I did because that I'm, because I'm traveling and I'm on stage and, and the immediately the stories you're going to tell in your head is, yeah, but but look what I'm doing. I mean, I'm giving them the quality of life. They can get to do what you want. My daughter can buy whatever clothes she wants. That's right. And, you know that we, we do this all the time. There was um, I just ran into the book the other day. I read I read some heard about somebody who wrote who refers to the stories in your head is uh, we're all in prison. Right. So so you you. You're in prison with those kind of thoughts. And what yes. you need is, I think the book, the book of the title might be Jailbreak. I could be wrong, right? Yeah. So the things that we do as coaches, the thing that you're talking about is you let them escape out of jail, their own jail that tells them those stories constantly. Yeah. Uh, that they refuse to believe. So, well, what I do uh, is I, to keep your analogy going, what I do is I hand them the key to the gate of the jail cell. Yeah. Say, here you go. And some of them choose to use it and some don't. And or that's some, a, yeah, that's an incredibly take, interesting phenomenon. Yeah. So so some of them you'll take that big chain thing, say here's the key, you open the, the jail cell, uh, keep the key, and they go around, they go out, come out of the jail grounds, take the key, chuck it, jump back into the car and go back to their old ways. Right. <laughs> that's so that right. Happens a lot that's too. that's so, exactly they they slam the gate shut and say it's safer in here. And that's the other part of this that a lot of the bullshit that happens in coaching from my perspective is it's a lot of tips and tricks and ideas. And if we don't address the thinking that created the reality they're in right now, then they'll just recreate no matter how many tips and tricks they're given. Look, that shit's all that stuff's all over YouTube. You can go to YouTube and get any tip and trick you want. It's, it's a brilliant place for that. But if you don't address the thinking that got you where you are, you'll recreate it. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because one of my, one of my clients um, discovered Tony Robbins because I always, I mean, I, I started with Tony because I thought he was a crook and then I developed a great appreciation to <laughs> what he does and this by the way there's nothing original that tony robbins does he might sue me for that but it's okay there's nothing <laughs> original his his brilliance comes from taking the best of of different people he's an amazing you know, delivery right? system and then put it all together and deliver it in a way that resonates with people and gets him to take action so so this client uh 
goes up signs after the Tony Robbins three day. I forgot. I don't know what the name of it is, but at the end you walk on calls, whatever that thing is called. And it's, and it's expensive. I believe it's seven, $8,000 for three days. Yeah. And he, he was all fired up, goes to the Tony Robbins things and he comes back. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And two weeks later, he's back to his old tricks. And I said, so what happened, man? So, but this is a phenomenon that happens all the time, right? It happened sure. to me for years. I watch some motivating, motivational speaker or somebody else. And I get all riled up. I excited. Wow, it feels good. Okay, time to go back to reality. Never mind about that. Right? <laughs> so, um, with coaching, the the good, the right kind of coaching, you don't get to do that, right? Right. Well, we get... go ahead. I say people don't change, and and that's meant to be a little provocative. Um, but it's also, there's there's some real grounding truth in that idea. Why I say people don't change is because we will, we continue, even after a moment of transformation, we continue a pattern of thinking, but how we relate to that thinking, like, are we going to believe the story or are we not? Like shame is one of mine. I am prone to shame. It's something that I picked up as a kid. I've taken it with me through my whole life. And shame is a place for me to hide and to quit. Now, when I had a transformational experience with that idea of shame, I made a choice that even though I'm going to experience the shame probably for the rest of my life, that's the not changing part, I'm going to relate to it differently. It's going to mean something different for me. I'm not going to accept it as a place to hide. I'm going to accept it as a motivation for reaching out, for connecting, for taking risk, for trying again. And that reframe is so, it's transformational. That choice, transformation happens in a moment. It's just a choice to put a different context on something that's probably going to be with you for the rest of, for the rest of your life. Yeah, I think as you as you were saying that, I was going to say people don't change unless they recognize that change is needed, right? Yeah, awareness. Um, yeah, and awareness. So for me, the number one, the number one ingredient I'm looking for when I look to work with someone is humility, right? If if you an arrogant and I work with a lot of rich people, successful business owners, um, and we can define success in another podcast, but they do pretty well. <laughs> um, if if the person is is arrogant, um, I could pick it up very quickly, and I pretty much tell them, "Let me be very honest with you. If you want me to work with me, so you can tell me what you want me to do, then save your money and don't waste my time." Right on. But but if you want if you want us to work with because you recognize that you can't do things on your own and that's the concept of coaching right it it works in sports and it works in what we do you can't we can't help ourselves that's a human byproduct so right um, let's let's uh, we could probably do this for another hour Chad but let me let me run through just a few rapid fire questions and I'll let you go sounds uh, great all right. The first one is one person who influenced your life, not in business. I've I'm already talked. Yeah. Oh, not already, not in business. Not in business. Okay, my wife. Yeah, that I was gonna. That, I was gonna say I'm gonna pick your wife because that's probably it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, what's the best advice you ever received? You're lying to yourself. Um. If you had a billboard in Times Square in New York City, what would you put on it? That's a great question. Uh, if I had a billboard in Times Square, what I would put on it is something to the effect of oh, geez, you've caught no, me. And, and, no, 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 I, I, I apologize. I actually, usually the only questions I share with my, my guests are the rapid fire. Everything else is like generated through our conversation. I don't have any templated questions. And I send those to you too late. It was like, 15 no, 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 it's, before. 
it's great. It's a good exercise. And I really appreciate it. There's, there's so much that I, there's so much that I wanted to say that I want to say to the world. And that feels like such a big deal. I mean, really what it would be, what, what it would say is probably, um, everything is about relationship or everything is the relationships are the foundation of everything something to that effect, just thinking about, you know, my context around that's, that's really the idea. Most people in business, in leadership think they're um, creating, selling a service or product. And what I say is you're actually just exercising relationship. And if we take that perspective, we can do something much more meaningful and impactful in the world. So it would be something that's not perfect, but it would be something like that. It's all about relationship that works for me. All right, Chad, I know you got to run. We could probably spend an hour more diving into coaching and maybe we'll do a part two of this. Uh, I am love to. thankful that you spend some time with me and go go make a difference in someone else's life next because hopefully that's what you're going to do now. Thanks, Zev. It's an honor. I'm, I'm going to, to record a podcast, uh, an episode of our podcast called Naked Leadership. So uh, with one of our governance experts, Mark. So I'm really excited and I really appreciate this conversation. It was an honor to get to know you. Thank you for taking so much time on my story. It's, uh, it, I mean, to be able to relay it is great. I appreciate well, that, it. That's, that's what this is about. It's, um, if it was a, if I was, all we talked about was coaching for an hour, it would be boring, but I always want to get to the, the person behind mm-hmm. the, the, the entrepreneurship piece to understand their journey with it and and great story we'll meet again chad thank you again for spending time with me thanks so much zeb my pleasure